Aston Martin Vanquish S Volante 2017 Review Luxurious 2 Plus 2 Super GT takes its V12 and handling balance to an open-air audience. What is it? The changes wrought to the Aston Martin Vanquish S Coupe at the start of the year were also made to the soft top, the Volante, at the same time. But then the weather was cold, and now it is hot, so here we are, being given the opportunity to test the roofless Vanquish S for the first time. Those changes, then. Last year, Aston Martin felt that although its Super GT car was plenty GT enough, it wasn't super enough, especially given the arrival of the DB11, and the need for this car to stay on sale for two more years. So it turned up the Vanquish's wick and called it the Vanquish S. What's it like? Power from the 5.9 liter, badged 6.0, naturally aspirated V12 went up from 565 bhp to 592 bhp, 600 ps, and although peak torque stayed the same, at 465 pounds foot, there was more of it, more of the time. More noise, too, thanks to a freer flowing exhaust that was part of the reason for the extra power, although the induction system was also revised. We've been running a Vanquish S Coupe for a few thousand miles and the sound is pretty sensational and rarely tiring. Externally, the Coupe received aerodynamic tweaks that made their way onto the Volante, too, although presumably they'll have less effect here because the shape is less slippery overall. Where Coupe and Volante differ most, though, is in their suspension. Both receive tweaks, and Coupe and Convertible retain the same geometry springs and anti-roll bars, but because of the Volante's weight penalty, its adaptive dampers get their own rates to cope with the extra weight and its location. From that perspective, the Volante is a pretty old-school convertible. In the mid-engine market, we've become accustomed to roof mechanisms adding no more than 50 kg and feeling no discernible loss of structural rigidity as a result. That's not really the Volante's way. This is a front-engined, aluminium-structured car with plus-two rear seats, which means you're chopping a large area of structural stiffness-enhancing material when you lop off the back of it. Then, in replacing it with a heavy electric opening, closing mechanism and thoroughly well-insulated fabric hood, you add 100 kg or so, just where you don't want it from a dynamic perspective, hi. Inevitably, then, the Volante is less of a sports car than its coupe sibling. But, I suppose, that's not going to be the choice, coupe or Volante, is it? It'll be Volante or Ferrari California T, Rolls Royce Dawn, or Bentley Continental GT convertible. And against rivals from other makers, the Vanquish S is arguably even more competitive than its hard-topped sibling, because there's no soft-top version of the Ferrari 812 Superfast to give it a hard time. Besides which, the Vanquish S's character makes it through the roof cut largely unscathed. The ride remains good and, although you're aware there's more girth being carried around, body control is tight, too. There is flop, mind. Of course there is. Look in the rear view mirror, which gets a little shimmy on over poor surfaces, and you'll see the rear seat tops getting their own little shimmy going, too. The steering has more kickback and wobble than a stiffer cars. But, heck, if you wanted the full Super GT experience, you wouldn't be looking at a convertible. So sit back, enjoy the fact that the chassis balance inherent in every Aston Martin is very much present, that the steering is still linear, the throttle response crisp, the 8-speed automatic gearbox firmly locked with precious little slush, and the sound far easier to hear, to hear. Ford Shelby Mustang GT 350R 2017 Review Ford has tried to turn the Mustang into a track machine by putting it on a diet and giving it a new engine. Has it worked? What is it? To put it politely, the Ford Mustang GT isn't the first car you choose to develop into a stripped-out, no-compromise track machine. For one thing it's a sizable old bus, it's 30 centimeters longer than the Porsche 911, a rather more obvious candidate, and some 10 centimeters wider, and for another, 
it weighs the better part of 1,800 kilograms. There wasn't a great deal Ford Performance could do about the Mustang's size, but to give the Shelby GT350R a fighting chance on track, it ditched the rear seats, stereo, sat-nav and air conditioning, although the latter three items can be added back in optionally. The wheels are exotic carbon fiber items, too, saving 6 kilograms at each corner. The total weight loss over the 5.0 GT is 60 kilograms, which is useful if not exactly transformative. The entire chassis has been overhauled with upgraded components and a much more track-focused setup, while a comprehensive aerodynamic package promises much more downforce than the regular car. Most unusually, though, the warbling V8 engine that powers the conventional Mustang has been ditched for a higher revving 5.2-liter flat-plane crank V8. That's something of a departure for an American muscle car, flat-plane cranks and higher revving V8s have been the preserve of European sports cars until now. The new motor revs beyond 8,000 revolutions per minute, whereas the outgoing crossplane V8 doesn't reach far beyond 6,500 revolutions per minute. The power and torque figures hint at a rev V8 rather than a lazy, torque rich bruiser. 2, 526 bhp at 7,500 revolutions per minute and 429 pounds foot at 4,750 revolutions per minute are not typical Mustang numbers. The soundtrack isn't typical Mustang either, the rumbling score replaced by highly strung snarls and barks. What's it like? As the most extreme Mustang to date, the GT350R goes to lengths not even the GT350 model would have considered in the pursuit of racetrack performance. In fact, Ford says it didn't even concern itself with trying to make the GT350R work on the public road. The standard car's plush leather chairs have been swapped out for heavily bolstered regress, while the steering wheel is wrapped in Olcantara. The sports seats are actually set an inch or two lower than the standard items, and with the steering column at full extension, the seating position is just about perfect. If Ford wants the GT350R to be assessed as a track car, there are few better places to do just that than Thruxton. The UK's fastest race track is a stern test of car and driver mixing ballsy high-speed sequences with tight and technical sections. The GT350R is more than up to it. Whereas the Mustang GT feels about as adept on circuit as a canal boat would, this stripped-out model feels right at home. That much more aggressive suspension setup takes away all of the wallow and floatiness of the standard car, replacing it with agility, control and precision. There are sections of Thruxton that demand so many different things from a car all at once, the start of the lap, for instance, combines a fast left-hand bend with a sharp crest and a heavy braking zone. Many cars would be completely flummoxed by that sequence, but the GT350R swallows it up without any trouble whatsoever. The steering is ultra-sharp and direct. The big Brembo brakes are excellent and the fat Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 tires generate enormous grip and traction. In the high-speed sections, such as the intimidatingly fast church corner, the car is incredibly stable, thanks in part to the aero package. There's so little body roll or dive under braking that you quickly forget just how big and, let's be honest, heavy the GT350R is. Chasing an 8,000 revolutions per minute redline in a Mustang is a novel experience. The Zingy V8 is right at the heart of the driving experience and it flings the car along at a mighty rate. It's also so much more responsive than the GT's cross-plane V8, it takes only a quick stab of the accelerator to bring the revs up during a downshift, whereas you really have to get into the GT's throttle pedal to awaken the engine, the engine.